Good afternoon. Today, the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight continues its longstanding work to save taxpayer dollars and improve government services for the American people. Our hearing this afternoon focuses on the Government Accountability Office's annual report on duplication, fragmentation, and overlap in federal programs. We are joined by Controller General Gene Dodaro and several GAO subject matter experts who contributed to this year's report. Their testimony will provide the subcommittee with a better understanding of the challenges described in the report and GAO, GAO's recommendations to address these challenges. Since 2011, legislative and executive action to address recommendations made in G GAO's annual report have led to roughly $600 billion in cost savings and other financial benefits, including nearly $70 billion in the past year alone. This includes $2.5 billion taxpayer dollars saved as a result of this subcommittee's work to address issues identified in previous duplication reports. I remain firmly committed to ensuring that Congress does its part to eliminate duplication, overlap, and fragmentation to achieve cost savings and improve program outcomes. That's why I've led bipartisan efforts to respond to GAO's recommendations for congressional action for the past four years, and I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues to pass these common sense proposals. So thank you, Mr. Dodaro, and your team for testifying today. I look forward to today's discussion on how Congress and federal agencies can work to be better stewards of taxpayer dollars. And with that, I will recognize Ranking Member Romney for his opening remarks. Well, thank you very much. And, and I will note that uh, I think it's Senator Braun and I have a bill in on site neutrality on um, this very issue of um, the location of where you get a certain service determining uh, how much you pay for it as opposed to what the service is. So I'd look forward to continuing to get more feedback from all of you. Um, so let me just start with this question. Um, many of the programs identified in this year's report have problems with fragmentation rather than overlap or duplication. Fragmentation occurs when more than one agency is involved in the same broad area, and these fail to adequately coordinate with each other, leading to inefficiencies and ineffectiveness. One example highlighted in this year's report is the federal government's fragmented approach to providing cybersecurity resources to K-12 through schools. Could you describe the consequences of fragmentation or a lack of coordination for K-12 through schools that need access to cybersecurity resources? Yeah, they basically uh, have told us they need training, they need incident response support when something happens, there's a ransomware attack or there's some other uh, issue at that, that point in time. There's different agencies involved, but it's basically education and DHS, which has their cybersecurity and infrastructure security agency. And, uh, you know, basically there's not enough coordination going on. Now, according to the National uh, Incident Response Plan, agencies that are dealing with different sectors, there's 16 different sectors in our economy, education is responsible for the education sector, and they're supposed to have a coordinating council among other agencies that would be involved, and they don't. And we recommended they have a coordinating council so they can understand more what the needs are uh, in the K through 12 area and they can then provide better support uh, to the schools. Well, thank you, because fragmentation is such a major problem across programs highlighted in this year's report. What's your general advice? What can agencies do to proactively coordinate and collaborate to avoid fragmentation? Yeah, they have to formalize their procedures. In a lot of cases, this is basically an anecdotal kind of uh, uh, experience where the individual departments and agencies, they're individuals within the department who coordinate with one another. If they change positions, they retire, whatever. It's not institutionalized. And, and, and uh, I, I, we have many recommendations to the Congress to require agencies to be put, you know, put in place in interagency coordination council. It's very rare these days that there's a problem that doesn't need coordination across the federal government. And it's become increasingly so. Many of the areas we've added to our high-risk areas are where there's lack of coordination across the government. Now, while I'd like to get it solved, in the meantime, it's like the GAO Full Employment Act, but, but uh, you know, but uh, it's a problem. And, and there's not, 
uh, a good institutional commitment. Without that, you, you have episodic success, but mostly not successful efforts. Well, and, and to Senator Romney's point, maybe measuring the effort, measuring the degree to which these efforts are institutionalized and, and, and prioritized is, would be a step forward there, because I agree with you. Um, it's a constant, you know, people say you should coordinate, but unless people right. really make an effort and formalize right. it, it may not get done. Yeah, we have uh, developed a set of criteria of seven factors that ensure successful co collaboration. Clear roles and responsibilities. What kind of resources are needed? How do you measure outcomes? Uh, how do you deal with conflict uh, in the issues? And so we evaluate against those criteria. But if Congress could also legislate that these coordinating bodies meet this collaboration criteria, which we've seen produce success, uh, and you'll see a lot of examples in this year's report where they meet you know, one of the seven criteria they'll meet, even if there is yeah. a coordinating body, it may not be effective. Okay. And uh, so that we know how to produce success. It's just a matter of people following the right practices okay. and principles. Good, thank you. Uh, so I want to turn to the issue uh, that Senator Romney raised, which is federal disaster relief. Federal disaster relief programs span across more than 30 agencies, as you noted. GAO found that this fragmented and overlapping approach to disaster recovery diminishes service delivery to disaster survivors and communities, exposes agencies to waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer dollars, and reduces the effectiveness of the recovery efforts. GAO recommends that Congress set up an independent commission to address these disaster recovery challenges. What benefit could an independent commission provide compared to efforts to simply require agencies to better coordinate? Yeah, well, in this case, I think there needs to be a, 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 a thorough reevaluation of the situation. You know, as I mentioned in my opening comments, you're having more frequent, more intense events. Right. They're, they're becoming uh, broader than just floods, wildfires being a great example. Uh, there's concerns about earthquakes, there's concerns about tsunamis, et cetera. So, so the, the, the circumstances for disasters, the panoply of dis potential disasters has broadened. Secondly, we consistently raise issues with FEMA staffing issues. FEMA right now has, is still monitoring uh, close to 500 different disasters that have occurred since 2004. And while we've become much better as a government in the initial response, we're not very good on the recovery process. And this drags on for years and years. The agencies all have unique uh, statutory authorities and regulations, and some of that can't be changed without statutory changes in the Congress. You have 32 different congressional committees that have responsibility for oversight over these agencies. And so you need, I think, someone who's independent in the commission. Now, what we did is we got a group of experts together, and we came up with, they came up with 11 different policy options that Congress could consider. The White House is looking at those policy options now and trying to figure out what to do. OMB is trying to look at it from a, from a, you know, a uh, consumer standpoint or, or somebody who's a disaster victim yeah. and how, how difficult it is to deal with all these different agencies and understand even what's available. How, you know, the uh, process is difficult to provide the applications. You've got to apply to different agencies. They're trying to simplify it into you know, one application form. I know there's some uh, legislation introduced in the Senate to require a, a uniform disaster application form. I think it's moving in the right direction. But I think this is a broader issue. And the agencies themselves have vested interests yeah. in the status quo. Right. And unless, and unless, you know, and unless you have someone coming in with an authoritative, and we have lots of experts in the country that can give this a good thorough reexamination, I believe is needed. Great, thank you. I'll recognize Senator Romney for his questions. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I thought that I had, uh, you know, an eye-popping uh, statistic when uh, some years ago I noted that there were some 49 different federal job training programs and thought the duplication was outrageous. And, but, but you've blown that away with, what did you say, about 140 different broadband uh, uh, expansion programs? Um, and, and 
I, I, I try to understand why that happens. I presume part of it is that all of us who want to get elected, uh, and that's the people up here, um, um, want to show that we're doing something about something our voters care about. So we fashion a bill, we get it passed. We don't really spend a lot of time asking whether there's already something that deals with that. Uh, we, we get that passed and um, the executive branch dutifully sets up a, 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 an agency or department or whatever to, to take it on. And, um, and there's never a cleaning up. Uh, and and I, I don't know what potential there is for actually cleaning it up. I mean, the, these 140 out there, whatever the number was, was it 140? Was that the number? It was over 130. Uh, over 130, okay. It's I'll, close enough. Close to 140, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, yeah. So what, what's the process? What, uh, because to say, well, Congress should deal with it. The challenge we have, of course, is that we don't have a person in charge of Congress. That the White House has a president and then a chief of staff and so forth, so they, they're more like a corporation that can carry out action. Congress is, you know, just in the Senate side, 100 people all pulling in different directions or in the same direction, but all pulling. Um, how do we actually consolidate and, and eliminate and, and put together uh, efforts so that it's easier for us to be able to address the issue that we're talking about without having tons of people and departments and wheels spinning and money being wasted. How do you get from here to there? Do you have a sense of what, when has that worked? Um, yeah. When have we been able to consolidate? Yeah, well, this happened in the STEM area, science, technology, engineering, and math. We have a, had over 160 some programs in that area. We were able to work with Congress to reduce it by having the White House and others have a strategy to look at the programs and make proposals to the Congress. And that's, we're suggesting in the broadband area that the administration come up with a national strategy. I mean, what's the plan here? You have a number of these programs to build infrastructure, a number of them to provide devices to people, another one to help them, set of them programs, afford to be able to purchase the broadband authority. None of them are really coordinated over a period of time. Some of them have different speeds associated with it. And this is an issue that's not gonna be static that if we do it one time, you're gonna have it all fixed. There's about 13% of the population right now, about 42 million people that don't have any access. And everybody's always trying to chase that. But then there's the question of once you have, you know, 4G, now you need 5G, now you need, I mean, and it's gonna continue in that path. So we need a strategy to say, what are our goals? How are we gonna measure? You don't really have that now and as a national letter level. And we're committing $65 billion through the Infrastructure Investment Act on top of about 40 some billion dollars that's already been spent. And if you date back to the Recovery Act days in 2009, we were spending money then on broadband authority. So it, it's gonna be an endless federal investment. And who would make an, an investment long term over time without a strategy and a way to check the strategy. So that, that's what we're calling for in this case. And I think, you know, Congress can require the administration to do it. They've kind of balked, they're still mulling it over. Uh, they didn't agree or disagree to do it. Uh, but I think Congress can require them to do it. And then you can have a debate on, on something right now than, rather than just all these individual programs. Going uh, it, it sounds like it's something that has to be executed by the executive branch. Right. Um, if they're not moving on that front, it, you're, you're looking to Congress to insist that they do yes. move on that front. Absolutely. I, I must admit, I'm a little frustrated sometimes. We'll call for, for the administration to do something, the executive branch to do something, and we ask them to do so much stuff that uh, it just doesn't happen. This yeah. might be a big enough uh, topic, uh, particularly with $60 billion in the infrastructure bill right. um, that, that might motivate um, an effort to really uh, make sure that we develop a strategy. Right, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 think, I think they're on the precipice of potentially agreeing, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do. But there's also potentially some statutory limitations to coordinating the programs. And so you need somebody to be able to advise and say, well, here's our strategy, here's what we, what we need to implement it, but we need some changes, legislative changes, in order to make it more efficient and effective to be able to coordinate you know, over time. But I, I, I think it's a big enough investment and it's not gonna go away. I mean, it's not gonna go away. If, I, if this was a one-time thing, I'd say, well, you know, the money's gone and you're gonna get what you're gonna get. But in this case, I, I don't think this is the last investment we're gonna make in this area. 
the, uh, the vulnerability of our various governmental systems for fraud um, is substantial, obviously. Um, but I, 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 my impression is that relative, the, relative to the private sector, the fraud that is perpetrated against the government is much greater. And I, I don't know why that is precisely, but my expectation is it's going to get a lot worse with AI. Yes. That the capacity of bad actors to hack into our system, uh, our systems will be greater. Um, and um, I, 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 I certainly don't want to reveal private information, but uh, I, I was approached by a, a, a colleague, uh, not, not a government colleague, uh, whose social security number was uh, stolen, address and name was taken, and and this uh, uh, person who stole that information filled out a two-page uh, tax form, uh, sent it in, and received almost a million dollars in a tax refund. Yeah. Uh, totally fraudulent. Right. Uh, that's almost never going to happen in the private sector. American Express is not going to send you a million dollars. I mean, it, it's just, right. Right. I, I don't understand how this can go on and how bad our systems are. And given the advent of AI, is it going to get a lot worse? And do we need to dramatically uh, up our game to prevent fraud? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, the, the fraud that occurred during the pandemic programs was epic in my experience, you know. I've been in GAO in two weeks. I've been in GAO 50 years. I've never seen it as bad. Now, we're throwing a lot of money at the issue, but um, we, we harmed ourselves by allowing self-certification in the beginning in the PPP program, Paycheck Protection Program, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, so uh, unemployment insurance forms. And I think it was well-intended. We were trying to get the money out, but you know these type of emergencies uh, the best in human nature comes out and the worst in human nature comes out. In this case, you had organized fraud. It wasn't just national, it was international. We've estimated that at a minimum, at a minimum, the unemployment insurance fraud is $60 billion. We're, we're making a higher estimate now. And then we're going to do a government-wide estimate by the end of the year on fraud across the federal government. We worked with the Congress back in 2015 and 16 to pass the Fraud Reduction and Data Analytics Act, which has, again, best practices for preventing fraud. Too many people in the federal government, program man managers, think it's the responsibilities of the inspector generals or GAO to combat fraud. It's their responsibility to prevent it in the first place. And they need more guidance and assistance to do this. If that act had been implemented properly, SBA and Labor Department would have been much better prepared to deal with the fraud issues during the pandemic. So that's still a, on the to-do list, is to get the agencies up to be better prepared on fraud. We need ident better identity verification approaches, more careful approaches. We need better data sharing. Now, part of the problem in the government is that there's a tension between sharing of information to catch the fraudsters and the protection of privacy on a number of people, uh, you know, a number of programs, and not wanting to share the information under the guise of privacy. And there are legitimate privacy issues, but they could, have to, they could be dealt with. On the IRS identity theft fraud, we, we suggested to the Congress years ago that they uh, expedite the W-2 data coming from employers. You know, employers have to get, had to, you know, previously they had to give it to the employees by January, all right, and then they didn't have to give it to the government till April. So the government had, didn't have the form to compare against the submission of the information return. So we got Congress to change that. That's helped a lot, but there's still some gaps in that area. And we used to have some open recommendations. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Romney. And I want to follow up on the, the line of questioning that Senator Romney and you were just talking about, which is how we prevent fraud in federal programs. But I want to drill down a little bit when we're talking about fraud in relief programs in particular. And as we were just talking about the COVID-19 relief packages and the fraud there, what are your recommendations? We know it's important to prevent fraud. Uh, there are lessons learned here, but we also, at a time like COVID, need to balance preventing fraud and being vigilant. Um, 
but we also need to be able to deliver aid quickly during emergencies. So how do we strike that balance? And your recommendations call for improving transparency and data sharing and oversight, but I'd just like you to give us a little bit more of a feel of how sure. we can accomplish these two things together. Yeah, absolutely. And they're not mutually exclusive. Right. I think you can have a much better balance than what we had uh, before. Uh, in, in, in this COVID-19 areas. Number one is you need to get the regular payment process right. Right, right now, the latest government-wide estimate of adding up all the agency estimates, is there was over $240 billion in improper payments made uh, in 2021. Now, this, is, this has been a problem well before the pandemic. Between 2003 and up to the most recent time, uh, there's been over $2.4 trillion in improper payments made by the federal government in regular program activities. This is not considering the pandemic. So you have to fix the underlying payment problem that the federal government has in the first place if you add additional money as we do during the pandemic. Secondly, you have to have the agencies implement these best practices for fraud prevention. They were supposed to designate an entity full-time to focus on this. Yep. SBA didn't do it until after all the money was right. distributed, all right? It was supposed to be done in 2016, 2017, when it wasn't done until 2022. Labor still hasn't done it to our satisfaction. And so there, there needs to be more attention to hold the agencies accountable for implementing these best practices, doing risk assessments, making sure they they can come up with the different suggestions. Now, we have a, a special report coming out to deal exactly with the issue that you talked about, which is how to build internal controls in before yeah. the emergency programs come up and how you can balance that so you don't sacrifice speed in getting the information out. That'll be out at the end of this month. I've also recommended that the Congress require OMB to require the agencies to have an internal control plan in place for emergency spending before emergencies happen. Mm -hmm. We know what the problems are, but and I've been trying to do this for years, and the um, uh, agencies have balked and OMB said, so well, our normal controls are, are satisfactory. Well, no, they're not. Right. And that's been proven time and again and was proven uh, very uh, vividly during the COVID pandemic, but it happens in almost every disaster that we have. So you, you need to have that in place. Second, uh, thirdly, um, every new program or increase over $100 million, in my opinion, I've recommended this to the Congress, ought to be designated susceptible to improper payments. Right now, under the guidance, you don't have to make an estimate if you're an agency with a new program of what improper payments might be until two or three years after the program has started. That's way too late. In some of the emergency spending, it's um, uh, the program's over you know, before you make your estimate. Uh, then last suggestion I had is during the Recovery Act days, uh, in the American Recovery and Rescue Act, Congress created a Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board of the Inspector Generals. Gave it, you know, several, about $80 million. And they were able to help um, prevent fraud in the agencies. They would identify where contracts were considered to be led or had just been led to somebody who, you know, shouldn't have been on the list or had some other kind of problem or looked like a fake address. And, and that was very successful. And it was extended when we had uh, Superstorm Sandy, right. and, but it expired in 2015. Now, Treasury had the ability to pick up that responsibility. They demurred. Yeah, I, I said, you sh I encouraged them to do it. They said, no, we don't get into that, that business. And then I went to Congress and I said, Cong you ought to make this a permanent feature of the inspector general community to deal with this improper payment problem, and then it's already there when emergencies develop. So okay. nobody listened to me. <laughs> and, and, and so then, then uh, uh, the CARES Act comes up, all right? So five years later, we're authorizing trillions of dollars. That 
uh, IG function was not resurrected even then. It wasn't until the American Rescue Plan, but after that, we already spent trillions of yeah. dollars. Now we're gonna spend more, but it took them a while to get it up and running again to, before it was effective, because a lot of fraudsters go across government. Right. So the, the IGs need to coordinate, they can share information, pull their resources, and some of the smaller IGs don't have the responsibilities. They're all supportive of this, and I've recommended Congress. It'd be a minor investment of a few million dollars a year, but it would pay huge dividends. Got it. Okay, thank you. Well, I look forward to working on um, a lot of those suggestions with you. Um, I wanna ask one more question, and then I'll turn it back to Senator Romney. Um, the American people expect agencies to use taxpayer dollars responsibly, but GAO identified an area where agencies are failing to use goods they already have, called excess property, and they're purchasing new goods instead. These include goods that agencies use every day, from printer ink and desk chairs to large research equipment and heavy machinery. What can agencies do to make sure that they're considering available property before buying new items? Yeah. Uh, GSA needs to ensure there's better guidance. We looked at five different agencies, and uh, a lot of them didn't, it wasn't clear in their policies, they were required to look to excess property first before making a purchase. Uh, you know, how to evaluate the pros and cons of, of doing that, uh, and then having some transparency over that, over that process. So we made recommendations to each of the five agencies to strengthen their guidance to make sure that they check on this beforehand. And there's tens of billions of dollars available in excess property. You know, some of it's you know, not in the greatest shape or might not match their needs, but I think about 12% of what we looked at uh, was, was actually used by the agencies to then not have to make those purchases. And GSA needs to make more um, clear their guidance across the federal government and working with <laughs> the agencies to make them aware of the excess property and, and how, to, how to be able to access it in a way. Thank you, Senator Romney. Thank you, Senator Romney, and I, and I appreciate that nuanced and balanced look at this because I do think we need more information about the issue of remote work. Um, I also think sometimes you have healthier, um, more energetic employees if they haven't had to deal with a two hour commute each way, right? So, and they get more exercise. So it's hard to know without looking at those outcomes and looking at the mission. So uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of that work. And I only really had kind of one wrap up question that really follows on the discussion that we were all just having about how do you um, make sure that as you all do this important work and come up with these recommendations um, that we really make progress on them. So. We were talking about the fact uh, that you do an annual duplication report um, and that we're seeing some agencies take action on some of the recommendations, but my question really is, are you satisfied with agency progress on the recommendations made in these duplication reports since GAO began issuing them 12 years ago? Uh, just tell us how you think the agencies are doing overall, and obviously we, need, we know it's not perfect, but... Yeah. Yeah, um, somewhat satisfied, yeah. Yeah. not really, Yeah. not really. Yeah. We could be doing so much more. Uh, there's still too much resistance to change yeah. uh, that I think it's disappointing. Yeah. Uh, I think there needs to be, you know, more leadership. But the, the, really the executive branch isn't set up to deal with these multi-agency issues that we have. The you know, OMB is a very small agency. You know, you haven't had a controller in seven years uh, in that position over there, which is one of the primary people we would deal with. OMB has small p political issues they deal with, trying to you know yeah. mediate between the agencies type of thing. There's a lot of turnover in government, uh, you know, and a lot of vacancies and open positions. It's really not, you know, structured properly to implement a lot of our recommendations. See, at GAO, you know, we have more continuity than anybody else in the government. You know, Comptroller General's got a 15-year term, uh, you know, and, and, and we look across the government. We have a lot of institutional knowledge and memory. And a lot of agencies don't have that. And then, and then you have, you know, the policy debates and issues about things as well. But uh, so much more could be done. So I, you know, 
I'm, I'm, I, I'm I, never, if I, if, if I was satisfied, I'm, I'm in the wrong job. Yeah, right. And, uh, okay. and, and I understand that, and it is, um, yeah. you know, uh, it is always hard to achieve change, especially in large organizations, especially sometimes mission-driven ones where their focus is on the, the customer service aspect, right. uh, but to the point we've both been making, the effective and frugal use of taxpayer dollars is part of customer service. And yeah. so one of the things I heard you uh, really talk about that I think is something we might want to pursue is how do we make sure that our agencies have somebody who is accountable for pursuing these recommendations and really taking on their agency's fiscal responsibility in a way um, that might bring it to the forefront and let them drive some of this change uh, from within. And uh, that really struck me as you were testifying. Yeah, no, no, I think that's a good issue. I mean, we, we have a, another report coming out at the end of this month. There are actually 19 programs in the federal government that have driven down improper payments. So I want, and we're trying to glean, okay, what are the common factors that cause that? But the number one factor is they made somebody responsible yeah. uh, for that action. And so, and there's some other, you know, they shared data, they upgraded their technology, they have, so, so we're trying to then take that and extrapolate it. But what, in the, in the context of what we need, though, in terms of dealing with our long-term deficit and debt problems, you know, I've seen more action on our recommendations on overlap duplication and fragmentation the more Congress focuses on, like when there were caps in place for the, yeah. the, uh, the Budget Enforcement Act of 2011. The first couple of reports we put out, you got a lot of, a lot of action. And most of the, a lot of the big dollar savings came in during that period of time. So I think with the current discussion about, you know, uh, trying to restrain federal spending in and, and, and some of these areas, that Congress should look more at our savings because we're making recommendations where people aren't going to get hurt, yeah. that where you're wasting money, where you're not, I mean, they're not going to, you know, and, and so they're smart ways to save money. And, and, and I think uh, they deserve a lot of attention. That's why we keep repeating these ones from the past. Sure. Sarah Romney, you had another question. 